Thank you, and thanks to everyone for joining us this evening, and also to Rizzoli for hosting this event tonight. Um, as Christine said, my name is Matt Stevenson. I'm a principal at the New York Studio of Woods Bagot Architects. Uh, and I wanted to quickly share how proud we are as an interdisciplinary firm of 17 studios around the world to publish these ideas with Rizzoli and with James Sanders, and to thank those within each studio of Woods Bagot and Erica who all have helped contribute projects, writings, and research to this publication. Um, while the city of Los Angeles is prominently featured within this book, uh, we as a firm are focused on how the principles of urban form may evolve along with mobility models in cities around the world. So I will then introduce, um, we have Matt Descharm, uh, Woods Bagot Principal in the LA office and West Coast Design Leader. We have James Sanders, uh, author of Celluloid Skyline and also wrote and produced the eight-part PBS series New York, a documentary with Rick Burns. And he's also the principal of James Sanders Studios and since 2016 has served as the Consulting Design Council Chair for Woods Bagot Architects. Uh, and Julie Lasky is a journalist, editor, editor and critic known for her work in, on new design in numerous publications. And she is the former deputy editor of the New York Times Home and Garden section, former editor-in-chief of ID Magazine and former editor at Interiors Magazine. So thank you all and hope everyone has a great time. Okay, so the thank you all for coming. It's so exciting to see everyone. This is the first event for the book. What we're going to do is I'm going to give a breakneck little overview of the book itself, and then we will move from there to a panel discussion moderated by Julie with Matt and me, and then open it up to questions, and then most of we have some wine and cheese uh, for a little reception so we can continue the conversations later. Um, this was a thrilling project to work on. Uh, we've been working on it since 2018. Uh, it's a combination of essays, data studies, design projects brought together into a single volume, taking on the extraordinary, epic transformation that is going on in Los Angeles since the 21st century started. A city that it was built on streetcars and boulevards before World War II, and then pioneered effectively the freeway, tract house, mall model that became basically the model of the modern city in the decades after World War II, uh, is now in a third iteration uh, called The Third LA by Christopher Hawthorne, called LA 3.0 by us. And uh, basically since, uh, 2000 roughly, you would say the city is moving in a different direction. We wanted to explore that, tie it into the history, and think about the future. The book is structured in three parts. Part one is called The Battle of Los Angeles, and basically frames this newest big change in the history, the broad and sort of epic history of LA by starting with the idea of the California dream. What is the California dream? It is more than just uh, a kind of a land use thing. It is kind of a magical idea about how one might live, which of course is symbolized at the top by David Hockney and a bigger splash, but in reality for many people was perfectly satisfied by a bungalow with a garage and a car. And through the 1940s and 50s in a crazy cycle of construction, freeways being built, tract houses being built, um, pioneering this incredible freeway system, uh, which, unlike New York's freeway system, highway system, didn't bring people into the center, but basically made the entire city into a giant sort of decentralized network of thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, in fact, of small houses, which worked very well for many decades for many people. Um, it did have really serious impact in the way that life was lived, captured by these two wonderful photographs by Ed Ruscha. I should say something which you've already getting a bit by what I've shown you, which is wherever possible, we've used the art of Los Angeles, particularly paintings and photographs, to tell our story. These two shots by Ruscha show the old uh, May Company building on the left with a street front and a street entrance and a parking lot in the back, and then the new May Company building of this mid-60s, no street front, no pedestrian life, all parking lots, and that was the way of life of the city. So we come to today and there's a big change going on and in part it's just based on the fact that that model isn't really working anymore. We can't build any more freeways because 
environmental laws won't let us. So the load on those freeways just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, this is a kind of, we all know the scene, the opening of La La Land, and it's funny and charming, but if you actually think about it, what other city in the world would have a musical number based on a traffic jam? Uh, that's the whole premise of the scene, is that nobody can move so they get out of their cars. Because that's what we've come to associate Los Angeles with, which is endless traffic and smog and congestion. And it's not just the fact that it's gotten what used to be kind of a joke or a punchline of getting around is now really a really serious issue. But it's also taken on a kind of a uh, environment, obviously unsustainable environmental way, development, exurban development uh, going on in such a way it's almost apocalyptic. These giant fires that occur are because you're building this kind of suburban style housing in places it shouldn't be. But changes happening. Simple things like Lyft and Uber are changing the way particularly young people get around the city. A lot of young Angelinos don't even have cars. It's amazing. Um, the whole rev revolution basically in tech-enabled mobility of one kind or another, be it Uber or Lyft or Revel, or the electric assist bikes, which you can, of course just rent and move around. Um, and less sort of glamorous and futuristic, but transformative, the building out of the metro in LA, which people say, what, the New Yorkers go to? It's the largest transit project built in North America since the completion of the IND subway in 1940 in New York City. It is a massive effort um, to build this new transit system. And it is changing Los Angeles, not only by itself. Los Angeles is densified. This is what the new Los Angeles looks like. It actually is large-scale development, multi-story towers, and metro. And uh, so we thought that was pretty interesting. That doesn't mean the car is going away or the freeway is going away, but there's a kind of a diversification of the culture. And it only promises to get greater, and this was fascinating to us. One of the aspects of autonomous vehicles that isn't much talked about is that people may not buy autonomous cars. You may just order a car like you do in Uber, except we won't have a driver. And thus, can be, doesn't have to be parked parked anywhere, can go out of the city and park itself at night and come back in. So what impact will that have uh, on the city? And of course, the last piece of the puzzle coming much sooner is the rise of electric vehicles. And what does that mean? So we, that was part of our study. Uh, our ch that, what I basically gave you there was our chapters one and two by, by Francis Anderton and Greg Lindsay. We move to our third chapter. Uh, where we go back and we tell you the story of the building of those freeways, a little darker story, because sure, for white middle class Angelinos, it was this great thing, but if you lived in the path of those freeways, it was not such a great thing. And of course, enormous disruption, something like 400, 500,000 Angelinos, mostly working class, poor people, many people of color, were in the way and saw their entire communities basically destroyed. And we have an interview with Eric Avila, who is a professor at UCLA, who talks to us about that. I mean, what did it take? That's Wayne Thiebaud's painting on the right with that incredible trench freeway. But think about what it took to make that. I don't think anyone has ever put these two kind of images together. But that, look at that. They have basically cut almost like a bomb, like a war zone site, sliced through a you know, relatively dense community outside of, uh, in East LA, outside of downtown. And Eric, clues us into a very interesting thing which was fresh to me. He said, you know, the way the picture, the way the freeways have been portra portrayed, he said, white artists tend to portray them looking down. So you get Ansel Adams' beautiful freeway portrait. He said, Chicano artists from Boyle Heights portray them looking up because that was their experience. This is Frank Romero. And he clued me into this extraordinary artist who I didn't know anything about, Carlos Almarax. He, he passed away and died of AIDS. But before he did, he did these incredible quasi-apocalyptic views. This is called Sunset Crash, and that's the name that we gave the chapter. We live in, we move forward into a new era. This is a project that we love called Destination Crenshaw, just happening right now. It's built on the transit line, the new connector to LAX. And yeah, there's a transit line going right through a community, but this time, by now, we've learned a thing or two. And this is a uh, basically black-led, black-designed celebration of the Crenshaw District. In southern in South LA basically and it's going to be an extraordinary thing it's a mile and a half long filled with public sculpture and public spaces that's Kehinde Wiley um, sculpture and there's
it's just the whole thing is filled. It's going to be the largest display, well, it's probably the largest display of outdoor sculpture of any kind, maybe except out of, outside of Washington, but it's certainly the largest display of black uh, outdoor art. Um, the, we come to a chapter that Matt really prepared, or is based on a, a project that he developed uh, called The Twist, and Matt is going to speak in more detail about it. I'm just going to touch on it. Um, we got to go around the city as we did these things. Um, one of the places that they looked at was the Sunset Strip, and so this kind of amazing culture, it's kind of the Times Square of Los Angeles, with this giant billboard culture, which in architecture is very interesting because a man called Robert Venturi and his wife Denise Scott Brown developed this idea of the decorated shed, the building that's a simple building with a big sign saying what it is. LA gave it a special spin by making it the core of mass entertainment culture. And so those billboards became the barometer of what was happening in the music world and the film world and the television world, who, who, whose agent had got this company to put money into the promotion of whatever it was starting with the door, and Matt will talk about this kind of wonderful project that he developed that takes that idea and plays it and brings it forward. Okay, part two is really where the book started, with a study of parking and what the future of parking in LA could be. And we prepared this, um, everybody knows that just there's acres and acres of parking, and you see numbers like 200 square miles of parking, it's devoted to parking in LA. Well, it's a great factoid, but it's absolutely meaningless, so what? What we wanted to know was how much developable space is devoted to parking. So we looked only at surface lots, not buildings and not garages and not curbside parking and not a few smaller than 5,000 square feet because you can't build on any of those. And we, can, we picked this central area we called the core metro area and we determined the data team at Woods Baggett, which is very sophisticated, determined that there was 25.4 square miles the size of Manhattan Island, in surface parking lots in Los Angeles. And uh, we did a whole series of interesting analyses. If you look at the, uh, for example, the metro coverage, as big as the metro is, it's hard, you have a problem in LA because it's hard to walk to the metro. But what if you could combine a short Uber ride and a long metro ride, which people are doing. We show what that looks like on the right. You see it actually covers most of Los Angeles. A $5 Uber ride plus the metro. And you can get around the city pretty well, and people are doing that. Um, we then looked at communities and how could um, parking lot reuse be developed for housing, for parking, excuse me, for parks, um, and for other amenities. After all, almost any use is preferable to a parking lot. I mean, it's the least good use economically and socially that you can imagine. We then, um, to people who said, oh, come on, what are you talking about? You can't, you can't get rid of parking in LA. We have an extraordinary chapter called Downtown Explosion, with, written by a professor, it's a Q&A with a professor from UCLA called Michael Mendel, which says, hey, guess what? They already did it. In downtown LA, little noticed in 1999, for older buildings, downtown LA, if you know LA, has this enormous downtown filled with hundreds of buildings from the 1920s and 30s just kind of like you would see in New York. Um, that was kind of, but they had gotten to be sort of empty. The whole area had kind of emptied out in the post-war era. In 1999, they got rid of the parking regulations, down to zero. You didn't need to build any new parking for, rent, for buildings that were being transformed, converted from commercial to residential use. And the result was an explosion in development, 12,000 new, new units in something like 10 years. And now, of course, the DTLA, as it's called, is kind of the, one of the most exciting downtown areas in all of LA, but it was made possible by a change in parking regulations. Uh, and we were like, well, that's not so hard. You could do more of that. We move on to exploring that idea about parking regulations, and we have a wonderful chapter by a man called Mark Valianatis, in which he traces the, the sort of weird and sad story of the relationship of parking regs and housing. And he points out that there was a time in the 1910s and 20s when LA had streets that looked like Manhattan, and that's, that's in LA, in Norwood Avenue. And uh, it was very well built up, and there were no parking regulate, there were no parking minimums, there were parking maximums. You can have more than a certain number of cars. Uh, but then they, the rules began to change. Maximums became minimums. Now you had to certain, have a certain number of parking spaces. A new kind of form was invented, a house for your car. 
Um, and the 1920s and 30s projects, particularly 30s and 40s projects, like that beautiful project called Doonesbinger Apartments, began to have a single space per car. Till you get to the 50s where the parking regulations are getting so strict that you basically have to give over the entire first floor of the of housing to parking because now you have to have close to two spaces per unit. And in fact, you see geometrically, you just can't fit that many spaces in without actually pulling the whole building off, which doesn't lead to a very kind of attractive uh, model. And then that became to people stop building the dingbats, they're called, those kinds of housing. And of course, we have the situation which has many causes, and we don't want to be reductive about it, the homelessness crisis in LA. Um, in bad, as bad or worse than New York and different um, because you have these encampments. But one of the reasons is that parking regulations have made it almost impossible to build housing, affordable housing. However, there was an extraordinary model that I jumped on, and this is a chapter I did. There was a beautiful model um, in the 1920s and 30s, which were the courtyard projects, which everybody loves. And I thought they could be a really interesting model for the future. So I studied them. One thing that makes them very attractive is that you see the way it works. The ends of the half building come to the street. That's one of them right there. So it doesn't look like a big project. It looks like two houses. So we thought that was good. They do, have, they do provide off-street parking for one space per unit. And they have this extraordinary California style. And nowadays, places like the Chateau Marmont has the cottages, and this is the, it's called the San Pedro, I've forgotten, it's like super high end. So I set it on myself to explore whether you could do a modern day version of that. So I included that in the project, and this is the project I call California Court, which is eight units on a two lot site. Um, and we did these renderings, which show it's sort of a political point to these renderings, which is that how would you complain about this changing the character of your neighborhood? And yet we've tripled the density or quadrupled the density of people on it. Here's the interior, and here's the detail. Um, we get now to uh, two other projects that Matt was very involved in. Christopher Hawthorne, who was the chief design officer for Los Angeles under the previous mayor of Garcetti, actually came to us and said, he was thinking about a really interesting thing that I didn't think, I hadn't thought about. When EVs arrive, Gavin Newsom, the, the governor, has announced that there will be no gasoline-powered cars sold in California after 2035, none, or trucks. Um, so what will happen to the 550 gas station sites when you don't need them for, to be gas stations anymore? And so, uh, you know, the classic LA thing of a gas station on one corner and another corner and another corner, all really good sites. I mean, there are remediation issues involved and there's a lot of bad stuff in the ground, but they're, they're excellent, excellent sites. So um, the, once again, the data team at a uh, combination of Woods Baggett and Era, which is its sort of sister consultancy, analyzed where they are and what kind of sites are they and what could you do with them. And we determined, not quite as impressive as the, as the housing, uh, the parking numbers, but still impressive enough, 20,000 new units, 40,000 new people, and it's coming. So we wanted to get the jump on that and think about it. And these were some alternatives for housing, parking, other kinds of uses. And the last project, which Matt uh, will talk about and in detail, was to look at a single site um, where, which could become an EV station. You don't have to wait to charge your EV. You can't do it, it's not like a gas station. Um, so Matt uses an opportunity to think about the culture of the gas station in, in the place of it in, America, in LA culture. Again, Richet on the right, Julius Schulman, extraordinary photo on the left, and developed a scheme which he's going to talk about called Pump to Plug uh, or Recharge LA. And uh, uses all kinds of you know food trucks and car meets and all kinds of things that are happening in LA. So that's our last shot. And that is the end of my breakneck presentation. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, James. And I would love to actually dive into some of the projects that you mentioned and make sure that Matt has some time to talk about them. So let's start with the fact that this book is about mobility, but as you mentioned, fundamentally, it's about parking. And Matt, I would love it if you could start with the twist and talk a little bit about how this is being proposed as an alternative to the traditional parking lot. 
Absolutely. So um, the, the twist is a project, and, and you'll see uh, a lot of the images that uh, we developed with James and the team uh, behind me um, as we're talking through this. The twist was a project that actually looks at a site on Sunset Boulevard um, or the Sunset Strip, and this is a particularly um, fascinating part of the world and a fascinating part of Los Angeles where you have this representation of, uh, of the billboard um, as, as a means for actually expressing culture. And so James talks about this quite a, quite a bit in the book as an opportunity to, as you're driving, understand the messaging and the advertising. What we looked at historically is that that is also an opportunity for an engagement with culture. So the Twist is actually a site that we looked at. This was actually for a client and in, in for the city of West Hollywood when it was finally developed. And this was actually a project that was originally, the brief was just to design a billboard. And what we looked at is, is actually this is an opportunity to create almost an immersive environment. And a lot of the ideas that we talk about in the book, and of course it's, it's very focused on uh, multimodality of transportation and the development of new technologies, but a lot of what we look at um, throughout uh, the, the pieces that we, we look at in this book is actually the opportunity for these technologies for an engagement with culture. And so the twist in particular is a site where we said, here is just a brief where you're looking at just an advertisement and you're using a digital advertisement on either side. But what we looked at is actually, is this more of an opportunity to have something where you can engage with culture? So the twist is actually named, and, and I wish the slides were behind me, but you'll see them eventually and you'll be like, oh yeah, that is the twist. Um, <laughs> but the, the twist is, is a project where we actually have the form of it, where we have two billboards on either side of the site, and then it's actually a twisting form in the center. And what that twisting form does is actually, it, it performs uh, what we call an interactive sustainability, which, which we think is very important when we engage with sustainability in our work which is to say you actually understand how the, the billboard, in this case the twist, is performing because the twist is actually uh, embedded with solar panels. So it actually twists so that it angles up towards the, uh, the ability to uh, um, uh, collect the sunlight, but then it would be the first billboard um, uh, that is also collecting energy that's, that's performing for um, uh, the, the digital representation that it has. So that's one piece of it. The other aspect of it is actually thinking about how this can become a, a backdrop for the local community and the local culture, which is to say it's not just the billboard itself, it's not just the, uh, it's not just the representation of the technology and the information, it's actually the ground plane associated with it. To, go, to get back to the ideas of parking, you know, one of the things that is very important in the work that we did with James and all of this is to say, well, what makes a really great public and civic space? And a lot of that has to do with an understanding of the surrounding community, which, uh, which we talk a lot about in the Recharge uh, LA piece. Um, uh, but it also has to do with an activation throughout the day. So during the day, it's actually a, a parking lot um, where it's an EV charger, um, but that there's an opportunity for a multifunctional space throughout, uh, throughout the times of day and throughout the year. So we actually look at it, a, a number of cultural events that the twist can be a backdrop for. It can be anything from a movie um, to uh, the information that it's displaying as an art piece, and we have a, a lot of examples uh, of that within the book. And it should also be mentioned, it's in West Hollywood and it's reflecting the billboards mm -hmm. on Sunset Strip. So, not, you know, in terms of the context of what you're seeing, you're still presenting the, um, the point of view of a driver driving through West Hollywood in exactly the way they would have done when you could actually move through the traffic. Yeah, 100%. And I, I think what's, what's interesting about um, uh, the, the piece in general is thinking about that everything in, in Los Angeles is actually experienced at the speed of a car, actually at 40 miles an hour. So when, when James is talking about the decorated shed, we actually look a lot at the different ways in which the Gugi architecture in particular um, was a representation of gas stations um, at, 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 a, at a time uh, long ago when gas stations were a place you would want to be. Um, and so there's, there's this idea that the buildings themselves are acting like billboards, and that's something that we wanted to represent within the twist itself. Okay, so we're talking about these different modalities and how we've adapted them to this particular space, including charging and parking. Let's talk about your idea for um, replacing a gas station, um, this, this modern, uh, or rather this, um, and I wish it were, actually there it is. Yeah, there we got, yeah. we got it, okay, look at that. All right, so. It's aligned. Um, 550 gas stations that you have identified in, and all sorts of problems, as James said, about remediating all the, the uh, leakage and the fact that you have huge tanks underground. 
what are you going to do with this space that's going to create this kind of dynamic public environment? Yeah, well, well for this for this particular uh, uh, site that we looked at, and, and so much of the work is, is zooming out at the scale of the city and then zooming into the scale of the site itself. And in this particular project, the brief again was something very specific to converting a gas station or a parking lot site to EV charging. And so what we what we look at and, and the way that we approach our, our design work and particularly the pieces that we've done with James in the book is designing with a sense of empathy, understanding that this infrastructure, the infrastructure of gas stations and the infrastructure of mobility and such had such a large impact on the urban fabric of Los Angeles. And how can we think about a new technology such as this, having the opportunity to create something that's more than just a, a site for charging your car. I mean, the provocation of thinking about the 30 minutes when you have to charge charge your car, what would you do with that space is actually a quite a good one. Because in the first instance, you know, there's the infrastructural element, element of that, the necessity for that to be a part of, of your mobility and your, your ability to get from point A to point B, which is so much uh, an influence on the, the fabric of Los Angeles as a whole. But we thought more importantly that it was actually an opportunity for us to rethink an engagement with the culture, um, the culture and community of, of these sites themselves. So what we looked at a lot was how the car actually became in, in many ways a representation of, of communities, anything from the low riders, the, the 58 Impalas that were having, you know, riding low on the ground to the, the JDM cars to actually the ways in which, uh, I, I promise I'm gonna get to the answer to the question, but there's, <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, th there's so many ways in which that the automobile became a representation for culture um, for different communities that didn't have representation. So that was a, a first instance that we started to look at, well, why can't we create um, these EV charging sites is something that is actually something that can change throughout the day, that can have embedded technology that actually is an opportunity for projecting out to the world and a representation of creativity for these communities that they can engage with. So it wasn't just about the EV charging site. Um, it was actually about how do you have, have people come and stay at, a, at a, a particular space and engage with it in different ways throughout the day. And I think some of the images of, of Ryan Gosling are, are uh, cycling uh, behind me, which is very important to keep everyone engaged. But um, uh, um, what, what, we, what we really um, focused on um, in looking at this site was uh, the fact that how can you have these kind of layered uh, opportunities of surfaces? So the ground plane, which has the inductive charging of the EV, actually, um, as the technology progresses throughout time, provides a lot of opportunity for activation. But then, really importantly, you'll probably see some of the structures behind me. It is Los Angeles, so we started thinking about, well, the, the engagement with the soundstage in Los Angeles, which is just an infrastructural element that allows the creativity of, of the media to be um, uh, to be uh, 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 structuring immersive environments. So we actually, within the sites, had uh, this, the structure of the forms um, that are serving as a canopy in one instance that can actually move into other positions um, throughout the day. In one instance, it's actually collecting energy because it's, uh, it's shading, which is very important in Los Angeles. Uh, but then in other instances, it's moving into other positions that um, are, are allowing you to have movie night, for instance, or if you have your car meet up, which is a huge aspect of, uh, of public space in Los Angeles, public space in a parking lot, which is something else we talk about quite a bit, um, that this can actually further reinforce the creativity that's occurring in those public meetups. Okay. James, I want to ask you about California Court and your solution, which has some similarities in the sense that you're looking back. It's a little retrograde in a really charming way, but you're also looking forward mm -hmm. to new uses of energy. And briefly, um, as I understand it, this is in an effort to increase density mm -hmm. in Los Angeles in an incredibly non-threatening way for the people, the NIMBYs who might be shrieking at it. Could you tell us more? Sure. Um, there, oh, I'll do this. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's a problem in LA and in every American city. Uh, it's called the missing middle. And it means, what that means is that the two kinds of housing we seem to be able to build are either single family houses, traditional suburban model, everybody knows that, you can build that, or big tall apartment houses um, with structured parking in them and so forth. And that's uh, fine too in its way, but the problem is in places like LA and many other American cities is that people who live in single family communities do not want those big tall apartment houses in their community or anywhere near it. Now why? Well, you know, it does change the scale dramatically of a, of a low rise, low density area. Are there other reasons? Are they worried about who might be living in those buildings? Maybe, maybe not. But 
That we can't really, as architects, really focus on. But what we could focus on is, are there ways to increase density to have something in between, the missing middle? Um, and there are a whole host of ways you can skin that cat. One thing that's become wildly popular in LA in just the last six years or seven years is the so-called ADU, the you know all about it. Um, Julie is making a living on it nowadays. Uh, the, uh, the accessory dwelling unit, basically turning your garage into a second home. And the number of permits for that has just skyrocketed in LA uh, as they've made it easier and easier to do. And it's a great way to like, well, you double the density basically, because where one house, one household was now is two households. But there are a whole series of other models that you can explore. And for me, many of them are interesting fourplexes and all sorts of things. But the courtyard housing of the 1920s and 30s was not just for me a higher density model. It was a model that had a magic to it. It had an allure to it. That everybody who in, everybody's seen those films where which are set in those wonderful courtyards in Chinatown and other great LA films in a lonely place. This idea of this sort of Edenic little courtyard with trickling fountains and and, and, and trees swaying in the breeze above you and this kind of dappled sunlight coming down because the courtyard completely surrounds, the, the buildings completely surround the courtyard or almost completely surround the courtyard. Maybe it's kind of a U shape. Um, you don't hear the city. You, you go into this like micro LA. It's like everything you love about LA, richness of vegetation, uh, water, uh, sunlight, sound, um, captured in this, in fact, very urban situation um, with eight households, ten households living on where two households were. Now, that's really important because when you get to, there's a kind of a threshold urban planners understand that 15 units per acre, are, the lot that we're on is a half acre and it has eight units, that means 16 units per acre, crosses the threshold which makes mass transit possible, public transit possible. Lower than 15 unit per acre, you're really gonna have a hard time sustaining transit. Above it, it's realistic. Um, so now you can live in a way, and there's one off street parking space, it's assuming that families will still need one car, but they don't need three, and or two or three. Um, so, but going back to it, there's a kind of allure to it, a magic to it, which really captured my imagination. And I thought that it would be a way to solve what is really basically a political as well as architectural problem, which is if you are building two-story little structures which appear to the street as these little ends of these little buildings, which are about 30 feet wide and 24 feet tall, and there's another one that's 30 feet wide and 24 feet tall, and there's some sort of little garden in between, that you could put this housing in a single family community and not, you know, there will be hardcore nimbyists, but you kind of reveal, I think, well, what's the problem with the housing, actually? There's no, you're not actually, we're not building tall, we're not building long, we're not changing the scales, house, house, our two little things, house, house, um, except that instead of one house, one house, we now have eight houses and then in our two little sites. So um, for all those reasons, and because it was a great opportunity to reignite my my love of what makes California special, if you go in those places, those marvelous courtyard places, you, you just feel like, where else could you be? It just feels like the most echt California place you could be. For all those reasons, I thought it was interesting to explore. Well, that actually brings up my next question for both of you, because um, Matt, you are taking advantage of a, a distinctly California experience, so much parking. Uh, James, with your courtyard idea, you would be taking advantage of the fact that California is so sunny, and that's why it gave birth to that particular housing type. Is it possible to take these ideas and adapt them to a place like New York, which isn't quite so car-centric and not quite so sunny? Well, we have a tradition in New York of courtyard projects. Um, it was very broadly in American history or American built environment history, the 19th, the, the period between World War One and World War II was a great moment of all over the world, people studying these kind of courtyard schemes. And you can go, I mean, the Dunbar houses in Harlem built by the Rockefellers for African-American families. It's like basically a block long courtyard development. And then all through uh, Queens, you have Metropolitan Life Corporation built 
these wonderful five-story tall courtyard buildings with great interiors. Um, and I wrote a whole book about it years ago. Um, the after, it was just a, a victim of World War II. It, just, it was a kind of housing that just was not popular or was not, it wasn't modern. And the Corbusier came and we had the tower in the park and everything changed. And now you weren't going to do these kind of wonderful career. But there is New York and Philadelphia and Boston all have their examples. LA's are particularly magical because all the ones in New York are lovely, but the ones in LA, because they can take advantage of that amazing variegated landscape. Um, they, there's something else special about the ones in LA, which, which I think is captured a little bit in the images, which is the, um, they feel like landscapes that happen to have little buildings in them. The, your feeling of them has to do with landscape, and then there are these white walls that are sort of, they don't feel like buildings with some trees around them. There's a, there's a kind of subtle but absolutely significant shift. Landscape first, building second. And I went back and I saw a travel log from 1927 uh, about LA, and showed these projects when they were new, because I thought, hmm, you know, maybe they just the landscape grew in over the decades. No, you look at the travel log, the landscape is there right at the start. That was just the deal. That was like sewer lines and electric power and gas and landscape. And landscape was regarded as important as any of those things. But so would it be exactly a model for New York or other eastern cities? No, but I think the Abbey Courtyard housing is certainly a model. I think that there's two aspects that, um, from, from the work and research that we did in the book, that very much apply to New York and, and other cities throughout the world. The first is, and, and James writes about this a lot, and so does Greg in, in the book, but the, the idea of the multimodal transportation and the impact of that. And even, even being here, I'm, I'm a lapsed New Yorker. I, I moved to Los Angeles a couple of years from New York. Even being here today and walking down the street, you can see the different types of modalities of transportation that are occurring that, that James talks about within the book. So one, I think that that certainly has an impact or applies to how um, we're getting around our cities. New York obviously being a better example of public transportation than Los Angeles. No one would ever make that argument, but that there is an impact on uh, the uh, activation that's occurring at the street. I think the second aspect that we really see and think about as it, it can apply to other cities is the ways in which public space can, can be activated and successful. We actually looked at uh, you know, some spaces in New York City and in Rome as they could translate to Los Angeles, and it was actually thinking about the relationship between those two. You would think that the, the parking lot, the, the flat surface in Los Angeles, well, it's certainly not as beautiful as the Piazza Nirvana or, or, or Bryant Park or, or um, you know, Prospect Park, you, you name it, but there are aspects of what make those successful spaces and actually what makes a success, successful public and civic space in Los Angeles is the same, I, I believe, in New York and other cities throughout the world. And one of that, one of those uh, reasons has to do with activation throughout throughout the day in different in different ways. One of them has to do with a real connection to the sur surrounding communities and being respectful of, of who's actually living in the neighborhood uh, surrounding. Um, and and uh, uh, I, there's a third, but I, I'm going <laughs> Well, I remember that you even proposed putting car shows in yeah. those spaces right. to activate them in California. Certainly, it, just... it, was, it, was, it was contextual, it was being contextual, it was actually being respectful of actually the history of the space there, which is funny uh, coming from someone who's living in Los Angeles, but it's actually designing around the, the history of the space and actually incorporating those ideas in. So to kind of put a, a nail on the head of it, it's actually thinking about some of the ways that we were talking about in, uh, uh, creating immersive environments environments um, through those parking lots, through those uh, EV charging spaces that can absolutely be applied to, to New York City. Um, this is a really dumb question, but I'm going to ask it. Has there been any investigation into slimming down the LA freeway and using any of that land for building housing? You know, I don't know. There's been conversation about, uh, well, there are some interesting things. I mean, one. We include, we really want to just make sure we touched at least on all the different things that are happening. Of course, so there are all kinds of ideas happening at street level, so to speak, or freeway level. But then there's Elon Musk and Hyperloop and the boring company, and they're wanting to build these new tunnels under the city. I don't know if anything's going to come of it, but they've built this mile long test track in, in, in LA. Um, another idea is autonomous flying vehicles. It's getting pretty serious. Um, Hard to imagine, <laughs> get into a flying vehicle that has no pilot. Um, but there is there are a lot of companies exploring it right now. EVTOLs, they're called. Electric, vertical, and, ta and uh, takeoff and landing. And 
the notion is that you would basically have a kind of elevated landing port, many of them around the city, you drive there, and then you fly over the city. But then one of the things they're exploring is the idea of flying over the freeways, using the right of way of the freeways, basically, but the airspace above the right of way. So you're not flying, flying over residential districts for noise and so forth and so on. There's already some noise. Um, putting the, in many parts of Los Angeles, they have run the new uh, above grade metro lines all next to the freeways. So yes, over the, that is. The, the, right, the right of way was bought years ago, decades ago, and half century ago, and so they have that. So yes, that's, that's, uh, that is part of the, that right there. There is kind of a counterintuitive idea around the expansion of, of the freeway in that if you actually add more lanes to it, it actually necessitates or, or uh, precludes people using it more. So actually it becomes, become, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that actually doesn't help with traffic necessarily. What it does is it actually invites you to have a car associated with it. So I think it's an interesting notion that in some instant or in some future you could actually reduce the highway and that wouldn't necessarily have that negative of an impact on, on your commute time. By the same token flipped around, the pitch is being made to Angelino voters that vote for Proposition M, which is building out the metro, because it will get cars off the road, which it will be good for you. And even if it costs some money to do it, you, that commute is the worst part of your day. So getting 10% of the cars off the road, that might be a big lift, but that's the idea, um, would make your traffic go a little faster. Because so we're, we're building, no, again, no new freeways, because the environmental law simply would never sustain it. So. Right. What kinds of, and this is gonna be the last question before I open up the floor because I know we're getting to seven, but I'm just curious about what kind of opportunities are being created by the Olympics in 2028? Uh, Matt can talk a little bit. It's a huge thing. It's an organizing thing. The metro is being built. The sort of completion of the metro is timed to 2028 with the notion that all these visitors are gonna come in. Many of them are gonna come from European cities, for example, or Asian cities where people are used to getting around by <coughs> metro, and LA wants to have a great new metro system to welcome them, not new, but expanded. Um, generally, it is organizing the um, energies of the city in a very impressive way. I'm old enough to remember the 84 Olympics and how that, I worked on a project in 1985 for Pershing Square that came out of the 1985 Olympics, 1984 Olympics, which were transformative for the city of Los Angeles. It was, the, it was the coming of age of LA as a world city, was the 84 Olympics when they did this incredible, exciting, I won't go into it, but it was a very powerful moment in the city's history and they're hoping that 2028 will be the same. Well, they have like a Sussman Parisia doing the graphics. <laughs> it from... was uh, Deborah Sussman. Yeah, yeah Sussman yeah, Parisia. Yeah. Well, she's not around anymore. No, no, I'm not like, like some kind of equivalent. I, I think I think James is absolutely right. I'm, I'm old enough to remember my dad talking about the 1984 Olympics. <laughs> and the the Thanks, Val. <laughs> my dad's here, so. Um, um, but I, I, what I can say is that uh, a, a lot of our clients um, that you know are associated with with mobility, associated with civic uh, uh, and public space, it's it's very much on the forefront of their mind and thinking about being ready for it. And, and I think. What is, what is unique about that is that there is kind of a, a concerted collective effort to be representative of the city to the world. Thank you. All right, questions. James, hi. Hey, Stephen. Um, I'm interested in hearing your view about, because there's a, obviously a calamity of, of electrification happening around the world, and obviously here in LA, it has a particular impact. What do you think, how do you think government and politics is handling the, this acceleration? In your view, are we dragging them to the finish line or are they pioneering out the front? Because all of this is amazing, but without a political, juggernaut behind it, this all gets very difficult. So what's your view on how it's... Absolutely, it's one of those chicken and egg things that you can't, you know, classic issue that you can't, you know, have the market unless you have the infrastructure and you can't have the infrastructure unless you have the market. So how do you break that impasse? And I, you know, say good word for President Biden who passed this enormous multi, multi-billion dollar bill to basically increase the number of charging stations in the United States fivefold. Um, saying that the government has to come in and break the impasse. And once those charging stations are there, and now it's convenient to have a car, and the car companies will provide and build the cars, then the electric cars, 
then you'll have a takeoff of the number of cars. And as I said, they're uh, looking at, California is looking at all car, all electric by 35, and there are about eight states that take their cues from their laws are based about mobility in cars are based on California's. Right. So a whole big chunk of the country, there will be no gasoline powered cars sold. And you know, Eastern states may be a little after that, but it's coming. It's really, this one's really happening. Uh, California, even as we wrote the book, the numbers kept changing. And when we wrote it, I think 18% of all new cars sold in California were electric, but then just that the book went to press, or after maybe, it was like 21%. It literally gone up by two or 3% in a single year. And now as you see, Tesla laid, you know, cut the path and now but GM and Ford and they're all and the whole UAW strike that just occurred, one of the big things it was about is that electric cars are a lot simpler. They have something like a third or a quarter of the parts of a because you don't have that engine and all the moving parts, they're batteries on wheels. So there was concern for the workers like would they have enough work to do?